Chapters 11 through 15 of Laugh and Live by Douglas Fairbanks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter 11 Self Education by Good Reading. The character of a man expresses itself by the books he reads. Every well informed man since the invention of printing has been a close reader of a few books that stand out from among the many. We read of Lincoln devouring the few books he had over and over again and studying from cover to cover and word for word the Webster's Dictionary of his day. We know that Grant had his favorite volumes from which he drew inspiration and solace. These men made eternal friends of certain great thinkers and drank in their learning with all the fervor of their natures. A few good books Digest it well, do feed the mind. Feed the mind. That's the idea, but how shall we feed it? The answer is easy, with something worthwhile, something that will inform and inspire. We can cram our minds to the point of indigestion with useless, frivolous information, just as easily as we may cram our stomachs with certain foods that tear down rather than build up. The habit of reading the right sort of books should begin early in life and continue through our days. Good books are real, and as we read we feel, hear, see, and understand in the way the author did. If what is said appeals to our way of thinking, a new world is unfolded to our vision, filled to the brim with things we can think about and add to our stock of knowledge. While we are buried in its leaves, we may live over the thoughts that the writer lived. For the time being, he becomes as real and vital to us as the dearest friend we possess. Gradually, as the time passes by, he creeps into our affections until our lives would not be complete without the comradeship of his cherished book. Books that become our pals are not necessarily books of the so-called classical type. Little-known volumes may prove to have enough thought stored away between their covers to keep us interested all our days. The great books will prove their worth in a short time, no matter how poor the binding, how bad the type, or how cheap the paper. These things are, after all, only the outward manifestations, and though we like to see our friends dressed well, yet we know that the clothes do not make character unless there is character there in the first place. And so it is with books. These little ungainly volumes which we purchase on the stands may be the classics of tomorrow, who knows? We select our library carefully. No matter if we live in a tiny hall bedroom on the top floor of a boarding house where we have a shelf somewhere with a few good books on it. Emerson's essays can be had in one volume and are well worth having. No other American writer has been so inspiring, so invigorating as this thinker of Concord one cannot read his essays without having a desire to get up and do. It is like a breath of fresh air, a tonic, a stiff morning walk. It stirs the mind to action and inspires us to lift ourselves out of the rut into which we have fallen. One returns to them time after time, each reading opening up new vistas of thought, new lines of mental development. As a man's stomach is what he eats, a man's mind is what he reads. It goes without saying that no healthy active mind could exist without the companionship of Shakespeare. Nowadays it is possible to secure the entire works of the immortal poet in one volume. There is a special Oxford University edition which can be had for a small sum. The type is large, the paper good, and there are many notes to help one over the rocky places. There is no doubt of the truth of the saying that a man who reads Shakespeare consistently and with understanding needs no other education. Like the philosopher Emerson, he boiled down the world's thoughts into terse sentences and one goes into a new universe when reading any of the plays. It is a good thing to learn parts of them by heart so that we can apply them to our own lives. They strengthen the mind. Their beauty lifts us into a great realism of splendid thought, and they fill the heart with a longing to do something great. 
such books should become steady companions through life. No matter where our duties call us, we should see to it that we do not leave behind the thoughts of this mastermind of Shakespeare. The very fact that we have them near us lifts us out of the monotony of nothing to do. Among the books about America for Americans, perhaps Roosevelt's Winning of the West is among the best. Not only has he thrown the whole vigor of his interesting personality into the writing of it, but he has given us a vivid picture of the conquest of the states by the settlers. No man could read it without being thrilled at the dangers our forefathers faced, at the great courage they possessed, at their hardihood, their bulldog tenacity. The reading of such a book is like going back over the years and living with them, sharing their troubles and their enthusiasms. The man who contemplates gathering a small library could not afford to do without the inspiration of what his countrymen have done for him. In choosing our books we must bear in mind one thing. Let them be inspiring. Let them be of a nature that when we read them we will feel like going out into the world to accomplish something big. That is probably the mission of great books, to inspire and uplift. The world's greatest men have been readers, would they have cared for books unless they were inspiring? It is said that when Napoleon was being taken to St. Helena he advised one of the officers never to stop reading. Most of the things worthwhile are, at some time or other, stored away in books by the thinkers. Every phase of history, every movement to better mankind and lift it above the drudgery of mere toil, every beautiful thought is to be found in them, and the better the book the more will be found in it of these very things. When we have finished the day's work we can pull down a volume from the shelf and in a moment be lost in an entirely different world. The man who neglects to read surely misses the one best means of broadening his mind. All books of the better class furnish food for thought and are excellent tools for the man of initiative. To read means keeping in touch with the big visions. We cherish these dreams and make them real in plans of our own. Aspiration is behind the pages of every worthwhile volume. It was the motive power which drove the author to produce it, and it should become a part of the forces which drive us on to victory. Without such inspiration we grope as children in the dark. We are without a light to guide us on our way. Books by such men as Marden and Hubbard are great generators of the electricity of doing things. They have put into words those innermost emotions which are the instruments of success. They point out a way we may safely follow. They loan us inspiration which causes us to act for ourselves. They give us the thoughts that are useful and practical which we would never have gained by virtue of our own reasoning power. They made it a life work to coin into phrases words that inspire. Out of their large experience came the logical sequences of cause and effect. Not to profit by their teachings is a crime against our own prospects. Without them we lag behind. Instead of progressing we look on in wonder at what is going on in the world. Sometimes we cannot connect ourselves with the big enterprises, and all because we failed to feed our minds properly. There is much to be gained both in pleasure and knowledge by reading historical novels and the lives of great men. The books of Sir Walter Scott and James Finemore Cooper are rated among the best in the world. Grant's autobiography and the personal stories of other famous Americans provide fascinating material with which to establish and fortify our test for good literature. The tales of modern American financiers is another field of absorbing interest. The man with small means can provide himself with a working library for a very little money. Books are cheap. The public library is always nearby, and there is hardly a town of any size but what has one. When we purchase a book we should be sure to obtain the best edition and be careful that it is printed from good type and on clear paper. Books are likely to become warm friends. We should never purchase an abridged edition. 
Binding is not such an important factor, although we like to have our favorite books put up in a handsome fashion. With Shakespeare, Emerson, Roosevelt, Scott, Cooper, Marden, and Hubbard, one would have quite a representative collection for a start. It would be easy to expand the list into many more. Of course, those collecting a small library who have a specialty will want books dealing with the subjects in which they are interested. However, every practical library includes books of inspirational character, and if one makes a study of the books written by great authors, it will be found that all of them profited by the reading of books which caused them to think. The Bible causes us to think, and no library is complete without it. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 Physical and Mental Preparedness It is not the object of this chapter to deal with a set course of physical culture, but rather to emphasize the necessity of keeping our physical house in order. There are plenty of books on physical culture which can be relied upon, and also any number of physical instructors who are able to advise and help along a set program. There are hundreds of places, institutions, clubs, YMCAs, and the like, which provide gymnasiums and every other facility for those who determine to build themselves up through consistent physical exercise. That is all very well to begin with, but afterward we must have some simple methods of our own which will not make it a hardship or a chore to keep ourselves in trim, a state of physical preparedness. It should become a part of our daily scheme to obey certain simple rules which tend toward an automatic effort instead of a discipline, and we should preserve in these until they become fixed habits. It is no trouble at all to take exercise unconsciously, and we only arrive at this by turning into an exercise any of our ordinary physical actions during the day as we go along. For instance, we can sit down in a chair and in so doing can add a certain amount of exercise to the action itself, also in rising. With very little effort we can come into the habit of sitting properly, posing the body as it should be, holding the shoulders in proper position, also the chin so that it becomes a hardship to sit improperly. All of this has to do with general physique. In walking we can go along with a spring, elasticity, and vigor of motion which forces a fine blood circulation throughout the entire system. We can stoop over in the act of picking up some object from the floor and at the same time make it a matter of physical exercise, and we may take a hat from the rack while standing away from it, thus stretching ourselves, as it were, into a little needful action. Putting on an overcoat or any part of our clothing may be done in such a way as to set the blood to racing through the body. Morning and night, upon getting up and upon retiring, there is every reason to make it a rule to exercise freely. The morning exercise wakes us up and sits us down finally at the breakfast table with a zest for the food set before us. The morning bath is an agency for good in this direction after we have given ourselves a good shake-up from head to foot. By the same token, Exercises at night before retiring induces sound sleep and takes away the strain of the preceding day. A very successful system is that of exercising in bed. Instead of immediately jumping to the floor in the morning, it is very inviting to go through some simple form of gymnastics in which the physical structure is brought into play. Physical exercise is something which can be carried to extremes. We can go at the work so intensely that we become muscle-bound and develop some structural enlargements that we do not need. This happens very often among athletes. The ordinary man should fight shy of such plans. Superfluous strength is only for those who have need of it. What we really want is strength enough to carry us through our daily rounds with comfort and a feeling of efficiency. In a sense we all live by our wits, and these decline when not properly fed by our general physical organization. Prize-fighters are not the longest-lived people, nor are the professional athletes. Their calling requires extra building up which would be a positive handicap to the average man 
whose manner of life doesn't require this super-development. In other words, there are intemperate methods of exercising just as there are of eating and drinking. We may easily go too far. Again we can sin just as greatly by not going far enough. There was a time when men of forty were as worn and old as men of sixty-five and seventy are today. As a matter of fact, nowadays a half-century mark is no longer a badge of senility when a man has kept himself fit and treated himself right. We all have friends who are pretty well along in years by virtue of their carefully planned physical training plus their cheerful dispositions. They are as sprightly and companionable as though they were many years younger. We should come to know early in life what a large part good humor plays in physical fitness. In previous chapters hearty laughter was extolled as one of the very best of exercises. It is an organizer in itself and opens up the heart and lungs as nothing else will do. It makes the blood go galloping all through the system. It is one of the best automatic blood circulators in the business. Laughter takes the stress off of the mind, and whatever is ahead of us for the day that seems likely to become a burden is soon turned into an ordinary circumstance. We smile as we go about doing it. A friend once said to a banker, How do you know when to lend money? The banker replied, I look a man in the eye, and then I do or I don't. The friend said, I would like to borrow ten thousand dollars. Now. You shall have it, sir, the banker replied. This meant that the man who asked for the loan was in a state of physical and mental preparedness. If he had gone into the banker's office looking like an animated tombstone, he wouldn't have had much of a chance to borrow the ten thousand. It goes without saying that the open-faced, hearty fellow inspires confidence. There is nothing coming to the dried-out sar chap, and that's what he usually gets. And what we get is largely a matter of our physical well-being. A modern philosopher observed that the blues are the product of bad livers, and there is no doubt but that he was right. The problem of life is to fill our days with sunshine. In so doing we shall find that the little graces are those which will lend us the most help. Tiny favors extended words of encouragement, courtesies of all sorts, unselfish work carried out in an open manner, true friendships and love, a hearty laugh, a sincere appreciation of the other fellow's struggle to keep his head above water, the conscientious carrying out of all tasks assigned us. These are our helpmates, and they are the products of our physical and mental equipment. Through these we come into our knack of detecting friends among those who are the salt of the earth. It is impossible for the person who desires good health to obtain it, or having it to retain it, without consistent effort. A watch will not run without the proper regulation of the mainspring. We must keep up our activities. We have taken the earth and are turning it into something to serve us, therefore the need of fine bodily preparedness. Nothing can take the place of achievement, and it comes through physical and mental efficiency. The one must not be neglected for the other. Both must be cultivated and developed alike in order that each may help the other. Happiness comes only to those who take care of themselves. It is the natural product of clean-mindedness. No pleasure can surpass that of a conscious feeling of our strength of character. It is an all-important element in men who aspire to succeed. The man who rises in the morning from a healthy slumber and plunges into the bath after some vigorous exercise is prepared to undertake anything. His world seems fair, and though the sun may not be shining literally, it is to all intents and purposes. Thus we may go swinging along with a cheery smile, carrying the message of hope and joy to all those with whom we come in contact. Oh, it's fine to be physically and mentally fit. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 Self-Indulgence and Failure The correct definition of self-indulgence is failure. 
because self-indulgence is comprised of an aggregation of vices, large and small, and failure is the logical sequence thereof. Even the habit of eating may be cultivated into a vice. Indeed, there are those who gorge without restraint, which in itself is unchaste and immoral. We've often seen them as, with napkin underfoot or tucked under the collar, they eat their way through mountains of food and wash it down as they reach for more. No use to say how and what we feel when we attend such performances. It is all right to say, look the other way, but it can't be done. It is human nature to gaze upon horror, sometimes in sympathy, but more often in amazement. Sometimes a well-staged scene of gormandizing viewed from a seat in the second or third row center of a softly lighted, thick-carpeted food emporium saves us the price of our own meal. We no longer hunger on our own accord. Our appetite is appeased by proxy, so to speak, and we can calmly fix our eyes on the big show and sigh for a baseball bat. No matter a noted bachelor of medicine declares, people are what they eat. The exclamation point is our own. We quite agree with our medical brother, for we have seen people eat until we thought we would never be hungry again. But there is more to self-indulgence than the food specialist has to answer for, so we will be on our way. For instance, there is the spendthrift. Surely he is entitled to a short stanza. We all know him. He goes on the theory that he has all the spending money in the world, and that long after he is dead those on whom he spent it will remember his generosity. Vain hope. Whatever memory of him remains will be of a different kind. Those who have been bored by his gratuitous attentions will take up the threads of their existence where they left off when he drove them away from their usual haunts. No longer will they have to dodge down alleys and run up strange stairways in an effort to avoid his overtures. When alive and in full operation, he knew more about what was best for us than we could possibly think of knowing. Left to his own devices, he would have us smoke his particular brands, drink his labels, eat his selections, wear his kind of cravat, overcoat, cap, hat, shoes, and underwear, and to make his proposition sound businesslike, he would willingly pay the bills. In this little amusement we are supposed to play the part of receiver and praise his generosity. Whatever may be our verdict on this chap, we must keep in mind that his inordinate desire to waste his substance was no less than a vice if for no other reason than its example upon others. It is just as bad to be a receiver as it is to be a spendthrift. If we cannot build up a reputation for generosity without becoming ostentatious, we might better take lessons in refinement from someone to the manner born. There is no desire to single out and set down by name and number every sort of self-indulgence. Excesses of any kind are indulgences, and it is easy to fall into them if we have not built up our stamina to resist. Our failures are usually traceable to ourselves. No matter what excuses may be offered in our behalf, we know in our own minds that we are to blame. Somewhere along the line of our endeavors we faltered, then we fell. Our conservatism, reinforced by our strength of character, finally gave way at a given point and put the whole plant out of business. Our system of inspection had become cursory instead of painstaking. Everything had been running along so smoothly we forgot that everything must wear out in time if it isn't looked after properly. A previous chapter entitled Taking Stock of Ourselves has a specific bearing upon the subject in hand. It emphasizes the necessity of taking stock of ourselves early in life in order that we may know our weak spots and take immediate steps to dig them out by the roots and replace them with hardy perennials which thrive on and on until the last day. And that reminds us that it is well to take stock of ourselves every little while. Even hardy perennials have to be looked after, the ground kept fertile and watered against the draughts of forgetfulness and neglect. And so it must be with our mental and physical processes, in order that each day of our lives we may go forth 
with renewed forcefulness, with every atom of character in full working order. Having started off on the right foot, we are less likely to have trouble with our higher resolves during the lean and hungry years of our youth when we go plunging headlong toward the goal of our ambitions. Usually it is not until we come into Easy Street that we find that we drop something somewhere along the line which we must replace at once or we will be laid up for repairs. But lo and behold, Easy Street is fair to look upon. It dazzles the eye, it takes hold of the sensibilities. Everybody wears Sunday clothes on this street and seems to be superlatively happy. Surely it would hurt to linger a while and see what is going on. Why, this is the most talked-about street in the world. Some of the people we have dealt with have told us about it. They said it was the only street for a man of means, for there could be found the very things for which we strive in life. They told us that the people we would meet represented the higher order of intelligence, brainy, alert, accomplished, a grand thoroughfare for those who would know life in the fullness thereof. Now it is a fact that Easy Street may be crossed and recrossed in safety every day of our lives if we do not tarry. Financial competence might permit of it, but competent efficiency demands that we trot along, keep moving, get away before we settle down into its ways. The action we need is not along this brilliant lane. But suppose we do take a chance just to test the serene confidence which we think is so safely nailed down within us. The very thought of it makes the caution bell tinkle in our ears. But caution is a species of cowardice, after all. We say, a man of courage may dare anything once. And just at the moment we waver, who comes along but our old friend, self-indulgence. The well-dressed, carefree fellow who once told us all about Easy Street and invited us to look in on him sometime. Nothing would please him more than to show us the whole works. And here he is shaking us by the hand and pulling us along, for he is an affable fellow and will not take no for an answer. Our struggle is feeble. A huge chunk of our strength of character falls off into space then and there. Even at the gilded entrance we try again to beg off, to slip away, but self-indulgence will not hear. So together we go through the portals leading into a grandeur we had never known, beyond our experience and power to believe. This is likely to become the turning point in our career. Bill Nye once said, When we start downhill we usually find everything greased for the occasion. We might add, except the bumps. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 Living Beyond Our Means Living beyond our means is a big subject that must be treated broadly, for circumstances alter cases. There is a sane way to look at every problem, and the matter of living beyond our means is one of the major problems we have to face. If every man was alike, and every avocation in life was on a parody, it would be possible to dispose of this subject in a paragraph. But men are not alike. What one could do successfully might easily baffle another. Therefore it seems advisable to consider the subject by looking into its depths. To most people debt is terrifying. To some it means nothing and thus we have individual temperament as an angle from which to consider. Living beyond our ability to pay means going into debt via the shortest route. Getting out of debt means a revision of our code to the extent of ceasing to live beyond our means and saving something with which to pay off what we owe. Some men can do this successfully. Others fail while seemingly trying their best to succeed and still others do nothing to stem the tide. With these it is a matter of how the tide serves. If favoring winds should drive them to opulence they would more than likely pay up, particularly those imbued with sufficient personal honor to make good. Such are the exigencies of life. We may as well concede that a vast majority at some time or other find it necessary to owe more than they can readily pay. 
emergencies arise which force us into expenses that require credit, and if we have so ordered our lives that when the pinch comes we have no credit established, the fact that we pay out our last dollar and go hungry to bed does not bring us much sympathy. Thus it would seem that to be able to say, I pay as I go, or I owe no man a dollar, or I never live beyond my means, is not much of a boast when, after a death in the family, or other unforeseen circumstances, we find ourselves broke and nowhere to turn for accommodation. It has been aptly said that people can save themselves to death. In other words, one may develop the saving habit to such an extent that laugh and live can find no room beside us on the perch of our existence. We must admit that the systematic saver of pennies misses a lot as he goes along, and with time degenerates into a sort of killjoy. In the matter of regulating his family to his way of thinking, he usually has an uphill job. Sons leave home as soon as they can. Daughters marry and breathe a sigh of relief, leaving mother behind to slave on in order that the hoard may grow. While all of this is true, it only represents extreme cases. Therefore it should not be construed that this chapter is launched against the habit of saving. Rather, its purpose is to suggest the thought of not over-saving at the expense of personal welfare. Our best plan would be to save in reason, not forgetting that life is here to enjoy as we go along. Then, too, we must have a credit rating among our fellow mortals just the same as a business person must have credit rating among financial institutions. Credit in business is worth more than money because it allows for expansion whereas money in the bank is only good as far as it goes. Many a merchant who bought and sold for cash all his life found when he came to enlarge his business that one thing was lacking, credit. The fact that he had always paid cash threw a doubt upon his financial condition when he proposed to borrow. He had neglected to build up a credit as he went along. The business world only knew him as a man who paid cash and exacted cash. Taken at his fullest inventory, he had scalped a living out of the world for which he had done but little to make happier or better. One calamity might easily scuttle his prospects forever, for instance a fire or a bank failure, and without credit it would be difficult to start over again. By all means we must save something for the rainy day as we go along, and our savings can be made up of other things than actual cash and bank. One item of our savings is the habit of keeping up our appearances. Living beyond our means does not incorporate the thought that, in order to save every possible cent, we should become slipshod and shabby. Carelessness in dress takes away from our rating as nothing else will, for it has to do with first impressions of those with whom we come in contact. Gentility pays dividends of the highest order, being, as it is, a badge of character neatness bespeaks character, and it is just as cheap in dollars and cents to keep ourselves respectably clothed as to indulge in shoddy apparel under the delusion that we have saved money on the purchase price. Good clothing costing more at the start lasts long and looks well as long as it lasts. Shoddy apparel never is anything else but shoddy, and well might it proclaim the shoddy man. When we throw away our opportunity to present a genteel appearance just for the sake of the bankroll we doom ourselves to defeat in the pursuit of knowledge. We cannot get all we want to know by the mere reading of books. We must mingle with people. We must interchange thought that we may crystallize what we know into practical knowledge so that it can be made into tools to work with. While the man of brains is welcome everywhere, the matter of his appearance has a lot to do with how he is received and with whom he may fraternize. Isn't it a pity, we hear people say, that with all his brains he hasn't sense enough to make himself presentable? But the worst phase of the situation is that the unkempt man sooner or later loses faith in himself and either ceases to hoard at the expense of his gentility, or he gives up his opportunity to mingle with others and lapses into habits consistent with miserly thoughts. 
the phrase a happy medium is well known and decidedly applicable to the subject of saving as we go along so that we may avert the sorrows which follow in the wake of living beyond our means it suggests a desirable middle course which permits us to adopt a sane policy rather than flying to an extreme it cannot be said that we are living beyond our means when by reason of our association with men of affairs we need to spend more money and thereby save less in preparing ourselves for the larger opportunities which will naturally follow young men often go through college on their uppers so to speak there is not a cent which they could honestly save as they went along without cheating themselves the point is that their situations in life force them to spend rather than to save money but in so doing the real saving was in the spending thereof they enlarged their knowledge and decreased their bank accounts for the time being what man parts with in an emergency is no license however for him to fall back into profligacy never should a man entirely lose the idea of putting something by the college boy in this case has simply invested his money into an education instead of a bank account once on the high road of life with a plan of action well defined and a regular income the habit of putting money away should become a fixed procedure in no other way do we accumulate except by investment and investment means putting away money at interest or in some project which promises better returns if we were to interview a thousand men on the subject of saving and draw upon their experiences we would find that by investing money at interest we pursue the safest course far safer in fact than the seeking of outside investments that promise greater returns the latter invites the mind away from the regular avocation and educates it in time to take chances that are likely to turn out into setbacks the mind instead of applying itself to the duty of making the most out of its regular employment allows its interest to become scattered over too broad a field it is not within the province of all men to become wealthy and after all wealth is not the only desideratum the happiness of mortals are found in the middle walks of life and not in the extremes the struggle should be to escape the life which saps our strength keeps our nerves on edge and drives us away from the green pastures end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen initiative and self-reliance the late albert hubbard defined the man with initiative as the one who did the right thing at the right time without being told at this point it may be definitely stated that such a man would naturally be self-reliant such a man would not lean on his friends he would stand up with them he would be found fighting his own battles without crying for help once a cub reporter was ordered by his city editor to go and interview a certain man after an awkward pause the youngster inquired where can i find him smiling scornfully into his eyes the city editor replied wherever he is this would seem to have been the start and finish of this youngster's newspaper career but quite the reverse was true he took the lesson well to heart thus starting himself on the road to self-reliance if he had repeated the offense it is likely he would have lost his job and also his nerve thereby spoiling his chances for a successful career the fact that he did not but went on and made of himself a famous newspaper man proves that he lost no time in developing initiative and self-reliance there is no questioning the vast importance that these two words mean to all of us many a man who did not grasp the significance of initiative became a leaner for the rest of his life many a man also missed his chances by doing just as he was told and nothing more his work ended there in due course it is inevitable that such a man should become part of the great army of discontented ne'er-do-wells who help to block the pavements in front of the loafing places hesitation vacillation and growing diffidence take the place of self-reliance he falls to the bottom like a stone and there he rests a drag anchor in the mire 
His job gets the best of him because he lacks initiative. Once stranded, he becomes an arrant coward, afraid of his own shadow. We must make our own opportunities, otherwise we are children of circumstance. What becomes of us is a matter of guesswork. We have no hand in compelling our own future. Diffidence is a species of cowardice. It causes a man's courage to ooze out at his toes faster than it comes into his heart. Such men often have big ideas, but having no confidence in themselves they lack the power to compel confidence in others. When they go into the presence of a man of personality they lose their self-confidence and all of the pent-up courage which drove them forward flies out at the window. Their weakness multiplies with each failure until finally the jig is up. Their impotency is complete. Very largely those who have big ideas to present expect to be taken in on them and to be given an opportunity to succeed along with their scheme. When a man becomes so unfortunate as to be unable through diffidence to explain himself, his big idea goes into the wastebasket and with it all of the hopes he has built upon it. Another nail has been driven into his casket of failures. To such a man all pity, but we will not allow him to escape until we have given him a pat on the back and pointed out the right road to travel. We mustn't preach to him or undertake to force him to do anything, but we will at least give him a helping hand and show him that there is a royal road to his goal. This man needs first of all to build upon his physique. Perhaps he has a bad stomach and likewise bad teeth. Exercise, regular exercise, should be the first thing on his program. Fresh air, long walks, deep breathing, dumbbells, boxing, rowing, skating in season, and wholesome companionship day by day. In the long run boxing will become his most efficient exercise. When a man can take a blow between the eyes and come back for more he has begun to fortify his own combativeness. That is what he needs in life's battles, the nerve to come back for more after a slam on the jaw that would lay another man low. And when it's all said and done and the exercise game has become a feature of his day's work he must settle down to good plain food and plenty of sleep. There is nothing in all the world like these things combined for the upbuilding and upholding of health and courage. Our success is a matter of courage. A man who can steel himself to be knocked down and get up immediately afterwards and hand the other fellow a ripping punch has added to his own pep. All courage is of the same cloth, whether physical, moral, or spiritual. To build upon one is to build up the others, the human system being constructed on such a basis that if one part is affected all the rest follow suit. A man who isn't afraid of a physical combat will readily match his wits with his fellow man. Physical training is therefore all important to initiative and self-reliance. Our natural aim is to make for ourselves a true personality that does not know defeat. When we come to an obstacle we must be able to hurdle it. It is all very well to say that the longest way around is the shortest way across, but it doesn't sound like initiative and self-reliance. There is one thing about men who rely upon themselves. They make no excuses, nor do they puff up over victory. Posing for applause is as distasteful to them as standing for abuse. All they ask is a square deal and the confidence of their associates. If they fall down on a proposition they get up and go at it again until success crowns their efforts. Such men have a way of turning defeat into victory. How immeasurably inferior to such a spirit is the fellow who whines and moans at every evil twist of fortune. He has no confidence in himself and nothing else to do except confide his woes to all who will listen to his cowardly story of defeat. Such men are least useful in the important work of this world. They are the humdrum hirelings, the dumb followers. The pitiful part of it all is that they could have succeeded had they but taken stock of themselves when the taking was good. But while there is life there is hope, likewise a chance. It is 
up to us. One of the startling things about men of initiative is the way they come forward in times of trouble. We don't have to point to Andrew Jackson in the War of 1812. We can look around us. Take, for example, a great fire. Haven't we often read of the brave firemen who sprang forward and by doing the right thing instantly saved a multitude of lives? Well, such a man is possessed of self-reliance. He is trained for the hazardous life he leads. When the emergency arose, he was ready in a jiffy to do the work expected of him. It is safe to say that without training such men would have botched the job, and instead of being praised to the skies would have sunk into oblivion under the heap of public scorn. Sometimes it happens that a man accidentally becomes a hero, but it was no accident that he was able to become one. He must have had initiative. He must have had self-reliance. Archibald C. Butt was such a man. He went down on the Titanic. The last act of his life was to help women and children into the boats and calm their minds as they were lowered away. Astor was of the same metal, both sublimely oblivious to the terrible fate which hung over them. Here was initiative and self-reliance in his highest form. And this sort of man is everywhere. The car in which we ride to work every morning contains one or more of them. Let something happen, and we will see them spring forward with a line of action already formed. At their word of command we automatically obey, and then when the worst is over a kindly voice reassures us and we go on our way rejoicing. What would the world do without these men? History is filled with the tales of heroes and heroines, and for every Joan of Arc there are thousands upon thousands who have done heroic things without a word of praise. Moreover, the really brave soul declines all ovation. No real hero claims reward. To have done the right thing at the right time is reward in itself. This quality of self-strength and self-dependence is not confined to any race of people, but in nations where personal liberty survives, initiative is at its best. Somehow, whenever the emergency, the man comes forth to do and dare. The Great World War, still raging as these lines are penned, has furnished untold thousands of examples of courageous action, enough to last until the end of human affairs, but they will go on and on in multiplied form, each day's score superseding those of the day before. It would be bully to know that we are doing our share in safeguarding the supply of initiative and self-reliance needed in this world. We must keep moving. The fellow who gets in a rut through lack of initiative finds that with advancing years it becomes harder and harder to get out of it so that the best plan is to make the move now while there is time to succeed. When we come to think of it, there are plenty of positions in the world for the right man, and if we have something to say for ourselves that lends credit to our ability, we stand a chance for the job. End of chapter 15 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Sixteen through twenty of Laugh and Live by Douglas Fairbanks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Sixteen Failure to Seize Opportunities. There is an old saying to the effect that opportunity knocks but once at our door, and that is all falderall. Opportunity knocks at some people's doors nearly every day of their lives and is given a royal welcome. That's what opportunity likes, appreciation. It goes often to the home where the latch-string hangs on the outside. It's like a sign reading, Hot coffee at all hours, day or night, very inviting. Very much different, however, from the abode whose windows shed no light and whose door is barred from within. Nobody home. That's the sign for this door. 
Mr. Numskull lives here, and most of the time he sleeps. When anyone knocks on his door he pulls the covers up over his head to shut out the noise. He's down on his luck, anyhow, therefore it would be a waste of good shoe leather for him to be up and puttering around. If opportunity ever knocked at his door he could say in all truth that he never heard it. He had often heard of opportunity being in the neighborhood, but one thing is certain, somebody else had invariably seen him first. He felt sure he would know opportunity if ever he met him face to face, and if ever he did he would have it out with him then and there. Meanwhile Dad guessed the luck. Always the fates pursued him with some sort of hoodoo, and his neighbors, well, some of them had sense enough to keep their distance and let him alone. Others, however, had not been considerate of the fact that a jinx was on his trail and were given to making sarcastic remarks concerning him. And thus it was that Mr. Numskull spent his days dodging his neighbors, sidestepping the highways, and obscuring himself from the very individual he wanted so much to behold, opportunity. At last there came a time when, in despair and in disrepute, he took to the woods and is yet to be heard from. Opportunity still visits the neighborhood, but the path leading to Mr. Numskull's home is grown up in weeds. The fact is that our real opportunity knocks from within. Through experience built upon consecutively by continuous effort, our vision expands and pounds its way out through the portals of our brain. We see the thing that we ought to do, and we go to it. To the man who didn't see it, the opportunity did not exist. What we don't know doesn't hurt us any, so runs the old saw. And here's a case where we who didn't see were hurt, but we didn't know it. For those of us who have vision there are all sorts of opportunities, but many of them are not good for us. The ones we make for ourselves are the healthy ones, and generally they are the best for us. Our own baby is the one we will take the greatest pride in and enjoy the most. Then we become masters of our own destiny in a sense and can be more independent through having no senior partners in the enterprise. Often our dreams bring forth a need for many kinds of special knowledge, and for these we go into the open market, offering opportunity to many others in return for their assistance. Thus we find that everything we do is in relation to other things and dependent in part on other people. This should make us careful and a wee bit wary. Opportunities are widely divergent in nature. Through a stroke of hard luck one might have difficulty in finding employment. The first opportunity might lead to a job in a barroom, but having fortified ourselves by developing our highest attributes such as honesty, integrity, cleanliness of body and mind, we are able to somehow or other pinch along until something better shows itself. First-class principles are not to be thrown away upon the first provocation, therefore in order to take away the temptation we might as well figure out that a great many employments in the world do not represent real opportunities and therefore should not be considered. Failure to seize such so-called opportunities becomes a virtue in the same sense that the failure to seize a decent opportunity becomes a shame. Often opportunity comes through meeting men of affairs who have power and wealth at their command. These are usually in connection with enterprises of the greater magnitude. Those of us who have the powers to control our destinies to a reasonable degree should not stand back in our support of these. If we have carefully built up our initiative, self-reliance, preparedness in the way of efficiency, good health and the will to do, there is no reason why we should not aspire to take a hand in anything in which we are confident we can succeed. Among the men who control the big affairs of the business world we find a true democracy. They want the man. The fact that he appears before them neatly attired, bright of eye, and ready of wit will surely count in his favor. In other words, we should live up to the opportunity in whatever form it presents itself after we have accepted its responsibilities. To make this perfectly plain, 
we must live up to the job. If we are to be superintendent of a coal mine underneath the ground, we will put on our overalls and jumpers, but if we are to be manager of a grand opera house we will appear in our dress suits. The thought is obvious, but as we journey along we find many of our fellow mortals neglecting to live in line with what they are doing. We mention this fact hopeful that we will not fail to seize our opportunities by setting up obstacles whereby we may become persona non grata through lack of discernment. Opportunity is within ourselves, and when we have seized our rightful share then we may look with pride upon our endeavor and proceed to laugh and live. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 Assuming Responsibilities Those who fear to assume responsibility necessarily take orders from others. The punishment fits the crime perfectly, and being self-inflicted there is no injustice. It is true that many men possessed of great brain power play second fiddle to shallow-minded men of inferior wisdom from sheer lack of forcefulness on their part. They lack the full quality of leadership while possessing all save one essential, courage. Fear abides in their hearts and spreads itself as a mantle of gloom over their super-sensitive souls until finally they struggle no more. Henceforth they are doomed and become the subject of apology on the part of friends and relations. He's all right, they say, but he suffers from over-refinement. He lacks something we cannot make out just what. It is altogether too bad, for he is such a superior man among his social equals. We must take our hats off to those who have the goodness of heart to make allowances for our shortcomings. A disinterested listener, however, is seldom taken into camp by such well-intended argument. He knows that friend-husband, or friend-brother, as the case may be, needs some sort of swift kick that will stir his combativeness into action. That will cause him to turn upon his mental inferior, and have it out with him then and there, once and for all. As a courage-builder fighting for justice is not to be sneezed at. Courage can be built up just the same as any other soul quality. It is all a matter of early training as to which we start out with, courage or fear. Unthinking parents have a lot to do with the propagation of fear in the hearts of children. A neglectful father plus a fear-stricken mother constitute the most logical forces which tend toward the overdevelopment of fear in a child. Once the seed is thoroughly implanted, the growth can be depended upon. How to get rid of it later is not so easy to figure out. Had the child been born with a club foot, these same parents would have spent their last dollar in an effort to straighten it into natural condition. They could see the unshapely foot day by day with their own eyes, and so could their neighbors. But the fear-warped little brain struggling for courage with which to combat its weakness needs must battle alone with chances largely against it. The mere thought of what is in store for this little one as it stumbles along from one period to another, fearful of this and fearful of that, is disconcerting to say the least. We can almost trace our friend second fiddle directly back to such a childhood. We can almost hear his fond mother shout, Keep away from that brook, darling, you might get your feet wet and catch your death of a cold. Another well-known and highly respected admonition belonging to childhood's R is, Come in, dearie, it's getting dark. Boogeyman will get you if you don't watch out. Some years later, when little son runs breathless into the home portal after being chased from school by some terrible boys, we can hear this same little mother as she storms about the place and tells what Papa must do about the matter. According to her notion, if teachers could not control the criminal element among the pupils, then it was high time for the police to step in. Never a word about little son taking his own part. Father listens in silence and half formulates the notion of going direct to the parents and laying down the law, while little son listens in fear and trembling in anticipation of what is coming to him if father carries out his threat. Tall oaks from little acorns grow. 
if the twig is not bent in the sprouting. Little son is bound to grow into manhood some day, and when he arrives he must have one particular attribute, courage. Somehow he will get along if he has that. He may also wear a club foot or a hunch back, but with courage as a running mate he will assume his responsibilities and become a force in the world. Once a great orator sat upon a rostrum listening to a speech by a man who cautioned his countrymen against taking steps to defend the national honor. We'll outlive the taunts of those who would drag us into war, he bellowed forth. Whereupon the orator jumped to his feet and with clarion voice shouted, God hates a coward, and then sat down again. Dazed at first, the vast throng sat stupefied, but only for a moment. Then as one man they jumped to their feet and by reason of prolonged cheering gave national impulse to a thought which has since been sermonized from thousands of pulpits. The orator had simply paraphrased and put pep into the old biblical slogan, The Lord helps those who help themselves. The effect was electrical. The whole country rallied to the idea with the result that we saved ourselves from war by showing the solid front of being ready and willing to defend ourselves. Everything that tends to build up courage is an asset in life. The more we have of it the further we go, and the more interesting our lives become. For the man of the lion heart all things unfold, and unto him the timid must bring their offerings. No one of ordinary gumption concerts the human fliver. Advice from him would be unavailing. His point of view would be inadequate, his ability to advise impotent. We go to the man who does things and say to him, Here is my little idea. Do you want to help me put it over? If it is good, he does. If not, his experience tells him so, for men of courage are naturally possessed of large vision. Their lack of fear has given them right of way over vast areas of the world of action. They fail only as their lights go out forever. With courage we can order our own lives and take orders only from those of superior wisdom. This we can never afford not to do. The courageous man of largest vision commands by his power to reason logically and therefore assumes the air of comradeship rather than overseer or boss. Only through lack of moral and physical courage are we to become the slaves of these. Courage, the child of hope, the despair of failure. Born of good cheer, it links its fate with the higher attributes and tramples underfoot the fears which spring up before it. When sown early into the hearts of the young, its companionship becomes unerring in its efficiency for good throughout their lives. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 Wedlock in Time It is a happy idea to marry while we are young, a fine thing, a good thing, a pleasant duty indeed to marry the woman of our choice at a time of life when both are at an age when adjustment is natural and lasting loyalties are implanted in our hearts and minds for all time. We make a sad mistake when we postpone so important a step just for the sake of becoming a rich man first so that our bride-to-be may step into luxurious quarters and never have to lift her dainty hands except to sip from the glass of nectar we have set before her. The real facts compiled by the statistical system Sam's are against this idea. The balance comes up in red ink on the wrong side of the ledger. According to these gentlemen, the average mortal is likely to be very fat and much over forty before he can make an offering according to his first generous impulses, and the chances are he will never reach the goal in his life. By the time he might be financially ready, there is a hard glint in his eye, and he will be looking for the moat in the eye of his lady love. The waiting game is a hard one, and it makes us worldly. After the lapse of years what once seemed a rose might appear to be more of a hollyhock. Naturally we never blame ourselves for the changes. Had we obeyed the grand impulse in the hour of our youth we might have kept the garden full of roses and the hollyhocks would never have sprouted there. 
then the home nest would have tinged our sensibilities with its loveliness and our affections would have been nailed down hard and fast forever and a day among the many baffling problems which the young man faces and for that matter any man is marriage more thought more energy and more time is taken up over this one decisive step than over any other the reasons are obvious it involves for life the happiness of the contracting parties not only in a direct and personal way but also in a general sense the man's business success largely depends upon the helpmate he has in his home his career is at her mercy for example if the wife should turn out to be unsympathetic and uninterested in his ambitions this fact might warp his prospects by causing him to lose heart in facing the large problems awaiting him along the road of opportunity however if she is of a cheerful energetic disposition and willing to do all that she can to help him over the rough spots as they travel along together he will be inspired into action and will do his level best he will be conscious as he goes about his work that there is one person above all upon whom he can depend his wife marriage is a serious business and usually we concede that point in the beginning however this is not aimed as a blow at life's greatest romance it is merely the recognition of an elemental fact marriage must have its practical side to become successful in the highest degree man and wife must establish a comradeship it is not the part of wisdom that either should rule the other but rather that each should have the interest of the other at heart and should strive to be helpful one unto the other two men can go through life the best of friends each holding the respect and the confidence of other so can two women then why not a man and wife needless to say they can and do such partnerships are sure of success it is only through lack of comradeship that love flies out the window and lights on a seagoing aeroplane the marriage state is a long contract it should not be stumbled into by man or woman nor should we become cowardly to the point of backing out of it altogether love is blind only to the blind either party to the tie that binds has a chance to know in advance whether the venture is safe and sane all a man has to consider after he knows his own heart is that the woman of his choice is sensible considerate and healthy other things being equal he can take the leap without hesitancy we shouldn't borrow trouble of course there are those who should never marry they do however and when they do they loan themselves to the mockery of the married state there is no time to dwell on this thought for it is just something that goes on happening anyway and has no bearing upon the advisability of wedlock in time between people of horse sense given a good wife after his own heart no manly man has a righteous kick coming against the fates under such circumstances if things go wrong he will find the fault within himself of course we should to the fullest possible extent be prepared for marriage before assuming its responsibilities we should at least have a ticket before embarking and it is the real man's duty to provide the ticket since it is to be a long voyage a round trip isn't necessary in other words a man needn't be rich when he marries but he should not be broke either lack of funds a few days after the honeymoon is too hard a test for matrimony to bear nobly it is too much like inviting a catastrophe through lack of good hard sense to begin with it shows poor generalship at the very start and there is the liability of causing great distress and hardship to a tender-hearted little woman it would be a sad blow to her to find that the man of her choice was after all just an ordinary fellow a man without foresight there are four seasons in married life spring summer fall and winter and we are going to need a comrade as we go through each of them and the one we want is the one we start with the gentle partner in all our joys and sorrows it is she who will stand back of us when all others fail when the children come along to bless our days and inspire us to greater efforts 
we are glad to look into their happy smiling faces and find that they resemble their mother. Their soft cheeks are like hers, their hands, their dainty ways, their caresses. And when Mama looks into those same bright eyes, they make her think of their daddy. The fond affection bestowed upon the children by both parents is but another mode of expressing their regard for each other. Springtime days, these, when little tots climb up and entwine their arms about our necks. If this were married life's only compensation, it would not prove in vain, for when the babies enter the home the tie that binds becomes hard and fast, if the man is a manly man. To become the father of a bright-eyed babe is an experience of the highest importance to a young man getting started. It reinforces his courage, doubles up his ambitions, and puts him on his mettle. He has a new responsibility, and it adds to his strength of character to assume it in all its phases. Another thing it brings comfort and joy to the mother during the long days while her man is out in the fray. It drives ennui out of the household throughout our springtime days. And when summer comes along, new hopes dawn within us. Springtime has found us up and doing, and when it merged into the new season we found our aspirations even stronger than before. Children must be educated and their futures prepared in advance as far as may be. They must not go into the world without tools to work with. Meanwhile, the household teems with plans and becomes a veritable dreamland of youthful fervor. We find that having helped our children into attractive personalities they have become magnets with which to draw about us their comrades. Thus we hold on to our youth by virtue of our surroundings, creatures of our thoughtfulness concerning wedlock in time. That the fall season is coming has no terrors for us. There will be the weddings and plannings for new homes close by, if we have our say, and in due course the grandchildren will come who will favor Grandpa and Grandma, and once again youth knocks at our door. There will be no dread winter days for us, for we have been forehanded. We have a new crew on board to chase away the cares of old age and infirmities. Try how we will, there is no way to forestall the operation of the law of compensation. We reap as we sow. The world will be good to those who compel its respect by becoming the right sort of citizens. Wedlock in time, that's the answer. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 Laugh and Live Again I find it expedient to resort to the personal pronoun, and therefore this final chapter is to be devoted to you and me. There are facts you may want to know for sure, and one of them is whether or not I live up to my own prescription. I do, and it's easy. I have kept myself happy and well through keeping my physical department in first-class order. If that had been left to take care of itself I would surely have fallen by the wayside in other departments. Once we sit down in security, the world seems to hand us things we do not need. Fresh air is my intoxicant, and it keeps me in high spirits. My system doesn't crave artificial stimulation, because my daily exercise quickens the blood sufficiently. Then, too, I manage to keep busy. That's the real elixir, activity. Not always physical activity, either for I must read good books in order to exercise my mind in other channels than just my daily routine, and add to my store of knowledge as well. Then there is my inner self, which must have attention now and then. For this a little solitude is helpful. We have only to sense the phenomena surrounding us to know that we must have a working faith, something practical to live by which automatically keeps us on our course. The mystery of life somehow loses its density if we retain our spark of hope. All my life since childhood I have held Shakespeare in constant companionship. Aside from the Bible, which is entirely apart from all other books, Shakespeare has no equal. My father, partly from his love for the great poet, and partly for the purpose of aiding me to memorize accurately, 
taught me to recite Shakespeare before I was old enough to know the meaning of the words. I remembered them, however, and in later years I grew to know their full significance. Then I became an ardent follower of the master philosopher than whom no greater interpreter of human emotions ever lived. In the matter of sage advice there has never been his equal. In Hamlet we find the wonderful words of admonition from Polonius in his farewell speech to his son Laertes, as good today as four hundred years ago, and they will continue to be so until the end of time. It matters not how familiar we may be with these lines, it is no waste of time to read them over again once in a while. They seem to fit the practical side of life perfectly. If we have any complaint by reason of their brusqueness, we have only to temper our interpretation according to our own sense of justice. In other words, if we wanted to loan a ten-spot now and then, we would just go ahead and do it. Meanwhile, to save you the trouble of looking up these lines, here they are in Laugh and Live. And these few precepts in thy memory, see thou, character, give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. The friends thou hast, and their adoption tried, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel, but do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new hatched unfledged comrade. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear it that the opposed may beware of thee. Give every man thine ear, but few thy voice. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy, rich not gaudy, for the apparel oft proclaims the man, and they in France of the best rank and station are of a most select and generous sheaf in that neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. The time has come to close this little book. It has been a pleasure to write it, and a greater pleasure to hope that it will be received in the same spirit it has been written. These are busy days for all of us. We go in a gallop most of the time, but there comes the quiet hour when we must sit back and take stock. I know this from the letters that come to me asking my opinion on all sorts of subjects. People believe I am happy because my laughing pictures seem to denote this fact, and it is a fact. In the foregoing chapters I have told why. If in the telling I shall have been instrumental in adding to the world's store of happiness, I shall ever thank my lucky stars. Very sincerely, Douglas Fairbanks A Close-Up of Douglas Fairbanks by George Creel Reprinted from Everybody's Magazine by permission of the Ridgeway Company, New York Chapter 20 a Close-Up of Douglas Fairbanks Young Mr. Douglas Fairbanks, star alike in both the speakies and the movies, is well worth a story. He is what every American might be, ought to be, and frequently is not. More than any other that comes to mind, he is possessed of the indomitable optimism that gives purpose, punch, and color to any life, no matter what the odds. He holds the world's record for the standing broad grin. There isn't a minute of the day that fails to find him glad that he's alive. Nobody ever saw him with a grouch or suffering from an attack of the blues. Nobody ever heard him mention hard luck in connection with one of his failures. The worse the breaks of the game, the gloomier the outlook, the wider his grin. He has made cheerfulness a habit, and it has paid him in courage, in bubbling energy, and buoyant resolve. We are a young nation and a great nation. Judging from the promise of the morning, there is nothing that may not be asked of America's noon. A land of abundance with not an evil that may not be banished, and yet there is more whining in it than in any other country on the face of the globe. 
if we are to die nibbled to death by ducks may well be put on the tombstone little things are permitted to bring out paroxysms of peevishness even our pleasures have come to be taken sadly we are irritable at picnics snarly at clambakes and bored to death at dinners the government ought to hire douglas fairbanks and send him over the country as an agent of the bureau of grins have him start work in boston and then rush him by special train to philadelphia if the wealth of the united states increased forty one billion dollars during the last three peevish whining years think what would happen if we learned the art of joyousness and gained the strength that comes from good humor and optimism doug fairbanks now that he is in the movies we don't have to be formal is the living breathing proof of the value of a grin his rise from obscurity to fame from poverty to wealth has no larger foundation than his ever ready willingness to let the whole world see every tooth in his head good looks artistry bosh the fairbanks features were evidently picked out by a utilitarian mother who preferred use to ornament and as for his acting critics of the drama imbued with the traditions of booth and barrett have been known to sob like children after witnessing a fairbanks performance it is the joyousness of the man that gets him over it's the one hundred percent interest that he takes in everything he goes at that lies at the back of his success he does nothing by halves is never indifferent never lackadaisical at various stages in his brief career he has been a shakespearean actor wall street clerk hay steward on a cattle boat vagabond and business man knowing poverty hunger and discomfort at times but never never losing the grin things began to move for him when he left the denver high school back in nineteen hundred for the purpose of entering college as he says a man can't be too careful about college he started for princeton but met a youth on the train who was going to harvard he took a special course at cambridge just what it was he can't remember but at the end of the year it was hinted to him that circus life was more suited to his talents particularly one with three rings a friend however suggested the theatre and gave him a card to frederick ward the tragedian mr ward fell for the fairbanks grin and as a first part assigned him the role of francois the lackey in richelieu what he lacked in experience he made up for in activity and unflagging merriment it got to be so that ward was almost afraid to touch the bell for he never knew whether the amazing francois would enter through the door or come down from the ceiling after the company had done its worst to richelieu it changed the shakespearean repertoire and for one year young fairbanks engaged in what mr wart was pleased to term a catch-as-catch-can bout with the immortal bard when friends of shakespeare finally protested in the name of humanity the strenuous douglas accepted an engagement with herbert kelsey and effie shannon in her lord and master five months went by before the two stars broke under the strain and by that time news had come to mr fairbanks that wall street was easy money's other name armed with his grin he marched into the office of decoupe and doremus and when the manager came out of his trance shakespeare's worst enemy was holding down the job of order man the name cope appealed to me he explained he is still remembered in that office fondly but fearfully he did his work well enough in fact there are those who insist that he invented scientific management how about that i asked him for it puzzled me well you see it was this way for five days in a week i would say quite so to my assistant no matter what he suggested on saturday i would dash into the manager's office wag my head knit my brow and exclaimed what we need around here is efficiency and once i urged the purchase of a time clock the way he filled his spare time was what bothered what with his tumbling tricks boxing wrestling leapfrog over chairs and other small gaieties he must up routine to a certain extent but he was not discharged at a point where the firm was just one jump ahead of nervous prostration along came jack beardsley and little owen two husky football players with a desire to see life without the safety clutch 
The three approached the officials of a cattle steamship, and by persistent claims to the effect that they had a way with dumb animals, got jobs as hay stewards. "'We found the cows very nice,' comments Mr. Fairbanks. "'No one can get me to say a word against them. But those stokers and those other stable-maids, pow, we had to fight them from one end of the voyage to the other, and it got so that I bit myself in my sleep. The three of us got eight shillings apiece when we landed at Liverpool and tickets back, but there were several little things about Europe that bothered us, and we thought we'd see what the trouble was. They hoboated through England, France, and Belgium, working at any old job, until they gathered enough money to move along, whether it was carrying water to English navies or unloading paving blocks from a seine boat. After three joyous months they felt the call of the cattle and came home on another steamer. Back on his native heath, young Fairbanks took a shot from the hip at law, but missed. Then he got a job in a machine manufacturing plant, but one day he found that his carelessness had permitted fifty dollars to accumulate, and he breezed down to Cuba and Yucatan to see what openings there were for capital. Back from that tramping trip he figured that since he had not annoyed the stage for some time, it certainly owed him something. His return to the drama took place in The Rose of Plymouth Town, a play in which Miss Minnie Dupree was the star. Meeting Miss Dupree, I asked her what sort of an actor Fairbanks was in those days. Well, she said judiciously, I think that he was about the nicest case of St. Vitus dance that ever came under my notice. William A. Brady got him next. Mr. Brady is quite a dynamo himself, and there was also a time in his life when he managed James J. Corbett. The two fell into each other's arms with a cry of joy, and for seven years they touched off dramatic explosions that strewed fat actors all over the landscape and tore miles of scenery into ribbons. Some boy, was Mr. Brady's tribute. Put him in a death scene, and he'd find a way to break the furniture." there was never a part that Doug Fairbanks lay down on. To every role he brought joy and interest and enthusiasm, and the night came inevitably that he saw his name in electric letters. It is not claimed that his work as a star elevated the drama, but it may safely be claimed that he never appeared in any play that was not wholesome, stimulating, and helpful. Nothing was more natural than that the movies should seek such an actor and they set the trap with attractive bait. "'Come over to us,' they said, "'and we'll let you do anything you want. Outside of poison gas and actual murder, the sky's the limit.' Without even waiting to kick off his shoes, Doug Fairbanks made a dive. The movie magnates got what they wanted, and Fairbanks got what he wanted. For the first time in his life he was able to let go with all the force of his dynamic individuality and he took full advantage of the opportunity. In The Lamb, his first adventure before the camera, he let a rattlesnake crawl over him, tackled a mountain lion, jiu-jitsued a bunch of Yaki Indians until they bellowed, and operated a machine gun. In his picture in the papers he was called upon to run an automobile over a cliff, engage in a grueling six-round go with a professional pugilist, jump off an Atlantic liner and swim to the distant shore, mix it up in a furious battle royal with half a dozen husky gunmen, leap twice from swiftly moving trains, and also to resist arrest by a squad of just Willards dressed up in police uniforms. The half-breed carried him out to California, and, among other things, threw him into the heart of a forest fire that had been carefully kindled in the redwood groves of Calaveras County. Amid a rain of burning pine tufts, and with great branches falling to the ground all around him, Dougie was required to dash in and save the gallant sheriff from turning into a cinder. Hair and eyelashes grew out again, however his blisters healed, and in a few days he was as good as new. The habit of happiness was rich in stunts that would have made even Batley Nelson turn to chatting with a sigh of relief. Five gangsters sicked on to their work by the villain waylaid our hero on the stairs, and in the rough and tumble that followed it was his duty to beat each and every one of them into a state of coma. He performed his task so conscientiously that his hands were swollen for a week, 
not to mention his eyes and nose. As for the five extra men who posed as the gangsters, all came to the conclusion that dock walloping was far less strenuous than art, and went back to their former jobs. The Good Bad Man was a Western picture that contained a thrill to every foot of film. Our hero galloped over mountains, jumping from crag to crag, held up an express train single-handed in order to capture the conductor's ticket punch, grappled with gigantic desperadoes every few minutes, shot up a saloon, and was dragged around for quite a while at the end of a lynching party's rope. Reggie mixes in was one joyous round of assault and battery from beginning to end. Happening to fall in love with a dancer in a bowery cabaret, Reggie puts family and fortune behind him and takes a job as bouncer so as to be near his lady love. Aside from his regular duties, he is required to work overtime on account of the hatred of a gang leader who also loves the girl. Five scoundrels jump Reggie, and after manhandling him four, he drops from a second-story window to the neck of the fifth and chokes him with hands and legs, after which he carries the senseless wretch down the street and gaily flicks him, as it were, through a window at the villain's feet. As a tasty little finish, Reggie and his rival lock themselves in an empty room and engage in a contest governed by packing-house rules. Three days after the combat, by the way, the company heads were pleased to announce that both men were out of danger, unless blood poisoning set in. The mystery of the leaping fish was what is known as a water picture, and Doug, as a comedy detective, was compelled to make a human submarine of himself, not to mention several duels in the dark with Japanese thugs and opium smugglers. Another day of it, he grinned, and I'd have grown fins. Manhattan Madness was really nothing more than St. Vitus' dance set to ragtime. Our hero climbed up eaves pipes, plunged through trapdoors down into dungeons, jumped from the roof of a house into a tree, kicked his way in and out of secret closets, and engaged in hair-raising combats with desperate villains every few minutes. It is not only the case that Doug Fairbanks made good with the movie fans. What is more to the point, he made good with the bunch itself. In nine cases out of ten, the legitimate star, going over into pictures, evades and avoids the rough stuff. To some, humble hearty double is assigned the actual work of falling off the cliff, riding at full speed across granite hedges, taking a good hard punch in the nose, or plunging from the top of the burning building. Many an honest cowpuncher, taking his girl to the show with him to let her see what a daredevil he is, has died the death upon discovering that he was merely doubling for some cow-eyed hero who lacked the nerve to do the stunt himself. Doug Fairbanks is one of the few movie heroes who have never had a double. He asks no men to do that which he is afraid to do himself. No fall is too hard for him, no fight too furious, no ride too dangerous. There is not a single one of his pictures in which he hasn't taken a chance of breaking his neck or his bones, but, as one bronco-buster observed, he just licks his lips and asks for more. To be sure, few actors have brought such super-physical equipment to the strenuous work of the movies. Fairbanks, in addition to being blessed with a strong, lithe body, has developed it by expert devotion to every form of athletic sport. He swims well, is a crack boxer, a good polo player, a splendid wrestler, a skillful acrobat, a fast runner, and an absolutely fearless rider. There is never a picture during the progress of which he does not interpolate some sudden bit of business as the result of his quick wit and dynamic enthusiasm. In one play, for instance, he was supposed to enter a house at sight of his sweetheart beckoning to him from an upper window. As he passed up the steps, however, his roving eye caught sight of the porch railing, a window ledge, and a balcony, and in a flash he was scaling the façade of the house like any cat. In another play he was trapped on the roof of a country home. Suddenly Fairbanks, disregarding the plan of retreat indicated by the author, gave a wild leap into a nearby maple, managed to catch a bow, and proceeded to the ground in a series of convulsive falls that gave the director heart failure. During the half-breed picture, 
Some of the action took place about a fallen redwood that had its great roots fully twenty feet in the air. "'Climb up on top of those roots, Doug,' yelled the director. Instead of that, Dougie went up to a young sapling that grew at the base of the fallen tree. Bending it down to the ground, as an archer bends his bow, he gave a sudden spring and let the tough birch catapult him to the highest root. "'What do you want me to do now?' he grinned. "'Come back the same way,' grinned the director. Most legitimate actors, the valuation is their own, find the movies rather dull. Time hangs very heavily upon their hands. As one remarked to me in tones that were thick with a divine despair, there's absolutely nothing for a chap to do. In lots of the godforsaken holes they drag you to there isn't even a hotel. No companionship, no diversion of any kind, and oftentimes no bathtubs. Douglas Fairbanks enters no such complaint. He draws upon the energy and interest that ought to be in every human being, and when entertainment is not in sight he goes after it. When they were making the half-breed pictures in the Carquinez woods of northern California he was never seen around the camp except when actually needed by the cameraman. Upon his return from these absences it was noticed that his hands were usually bleeding and his clothing stained and torn. "'What in the name of mischief have you been doing now?' the director demanded on a day when Fairbanks' wardrobe was almost a total loss. "'Trapping!' chirped the star. Beating about the woods, Bret Hart in hand, he had managed to discover an old woodsman who still held to the ancient industries of his youth. The trapper's specialty was bobcats, and the bleeding hands and torn clothes came from Doug's earnest efforts to handle the varmints just as his venerable preceptor handled them. Out of the experience, at least, he brought an intimate knowledge of field, forest, and stream, for over the fire and in their walk he had pumped the old man dry. In the same way he made the good bad man hand him over everything of value that frontier life contained. The picture was taken out in the Mojave Desert. For the making of it the director had scoured the West for riders and ropers and cowboys of the old school. He men, every one of them, and for a time they looked with dislike and suspicion upon the star. But when they saw that Fairbanks did not ask for any double, and took the hardest tumble with a grin, they received him into their fellowship with a heartfelt yell. Dull in the Mojave Desert? Why, he had to sit up nights to keep even with his engagements. From one man he learned bronco-busting, from another fancy roping, and from others all that there is to know about horses, cattle, mountain and plain, and around the campfires he got stories of the winning of the West such as never found their way into histories. When one picture called for jiu-jitsu work he didn't rest satisfied with learning just enough to get by. Every spare moment found him in a clinch with the Japanese expert, mastering every secret, perfecting himself in every hold. Same way with boxing. When no pugilist came handy, he put on the gloves with anyone willing to take chances on a black eye, keeping at it until today they have to hire professionals when he figures in a movie fight. When they made a water picture he never stopped until he could duplicate every trick known to the professor who drilled the extra men. He took advantage of a biplane flight to make friends with the aeronaut, and by the time the picture was done he was as good a driver as the expert. No matter where he is, or what the job, he finds something of interest because he goes upon the theory that every minute is meant to be lived. Maroon him at a crossroads with five hours until train time, and he'd have the operator's first name in ten minutes and be learning the Morse alphabet, after which he would rush up to his new friend's house to see the babies or to pass judgment on a Holstein calf or a black Menorca brood. It is the tremendously human quality, more than anything else, that gets him across. People like him because he likes them. He attracts interest because he takes interest. Talk with any of the big men in the motion picture industry, that is, those with brains and education, and they will tell you that personality counts more in pictures than it does on the stage. H. B. Aiken president of the Triangle Film Corporation, said to me, The screen is intimate. The camera brings the actor right into your lap. In the speaking drama, makeup and footlights change and hide. 
but not the least flicker of expression is lost in the picture. It's a test of realness, and it takes a real man or a real woman to stand it. Art isn't the thing at all, nor do looks count for half as much as people suppose. It's what's back of the art and the looks that makes the hit, and if they haven't got something, the artist and the beauty don't last long. We picked Douglas Fairbanks as a likely film star, not on account of his stunts as the majority think, but because of the splendid humanness that fairly oozed out of him. When he isn't before the camera, or fooling with an airship or a motor, or playing with children, or getting acquainted with a tramp or a trapper, or practicing stunts with a rope or a horse, young Mr. Fairbanks fills in his spare time writing scenarios. As everyone knows, the motion picture drama has been a tawdry thing for the most part, either a rehash of old stage plays, novels and short stories, or else mediocre originalities that epitomize banality. Young Mr. Fairbanks descended from the established custom from the very start. It's all wrong, he declared. We've got to stand on our own feet. Develop your own dramatists. Practically every play in which he has appeared sprang from his personal suggestion, and in many of them he has collaborated with a scenario writer. The three things that he demands are action, wholesomeness, and sentiment that rings true. Never make the mistake of thinking that Douglas Fairbanks starts and finishes with mere good humor and physical exuberance. There is more to him than his grin, for his mind is as strong and vigorous as his body. He reads and thinks and behind his smile is a quick and eager sympathy that takes account of the sadnesses of life as well as its promises. The habit of happiness was very much his own idea, and in it he took occasion to show a midnight breadline, the misery of the slums, and various forms of social injustice. It isn't that he thinks himself called to uplift and reform, but, as he expresses it, every little bit helps. In the last talk I had with him he was enthusiastic over the future of the movies as a world force. He speaks in ideas rather than words, for when he feels that he has indicated the thought he never troubles to finish the particular sentence. Pictures are like music, he declared. They speak a universal language, great industry, just in its infancy. Before long films will pass from one country to another. Internationalism why not? Love, hate, grief, ambition, laughter, they belong to one race as much as the other. All peoples understand them. It's hard to hate people after you know them. Pictures will let us know each other. They'll break down the hard national lines that now make for war and suspicion. Other things followed, for we discussed everything from cabbages to kings, and then I plumped the question at him that I had been waiting to ask from the first. How do you like the movies as compared to the speaking drama? Come now, cross your heart and hope to die. When the night comes down and the lights go up, isn't there a blue minute now and then? Surest thing you know, he grinned. It isn't because there's such a radical difference between the talkies and the movies, however. He refers to musical comedy as the screamies. The play in the theater is largely a matter of pantomime, you know. Dialogue is employed to advance the actual plot only when it is impossible or impractical to do it with dumb show. And when I think of some of the lines I've been called upon to spout, I can't say that I regret the movie's lack of dialogue. What does hurt, though, he admitted, is the absence of response. I don't mean applause, but the something that comes up over the footlights to you from the audience, the big something that tells you instantly whether you have hit it or missed, whether you are ringing true or false. You don't get that in pictures. Your audience is the director, and you know that it will be weeks or months before your work is going to get its test. But in everything else the movie has the talkie skinned a mile. Instead of mouthing somebody else's words you are doing the thing yourself. There's action and life. One day you are in the forest, the next in the desert, the next on the sea. Nonsense! I exclaimed. I understand that it's all done in a studio. I had that idea myself, he laughed, but no more. When I was in the talkies I used to hear a lot about realism. Father must wash in a real basin with real water and real soap. 
there had to be two hens at least in every barnyard scene, and when Lottie came home from the cruel city she had to have a real baby in her arms. Lordy, I never knew what realism was until I struck the movies. They've gone crazy over it. The half-breed, you know, was adapted from one of Bret Hart's stories, and nothing would do the director but a trip up to the Carquinez Woods in northern California. A forest fire figured in one of the scenes, but I never thought much about it until I saw them bringing up some chemical engines, hose reels, and five or six fire brigades. What's the idea, I asked? To keep the flames from spreading, they told me. And let me tell you, it was some fire. After I got out of it, I felt like a shave from a Mexican barber. What effect is the movie going to have on the speaking drama? was my next question. Look at the effect it's had already, he said. Shaw is the only playwright clever enough to write dialogue that will hold any number of people in the theater. The motion picture has made the public demand action. It has changed the plot and progress of the drama completely. Do you think that a good thing? Doesn't it mean the substitution of feeling for thinking? Well, he answered slowly, the world goes forward through the heart rather than through the head. Happiness, to my mind, is emotional, not mental, and the movie has brought happiness to millions whose lives were formerly drab and sordid. I love to go into these little halls in out-of-the-way places and see the men, women, and children packed there of an evening. Theatrical companies never reached the villages, and the men had no place but the saloon, the women no place but the kitchen or the front porch. The camera has brought the world to their doors, and life is richer and happier and better for it. Take him as he stands, and Douglas Fairbanks comes close to being the real thing. Men like him as well as women, and best proof of all, the kids adore him. On a recent visit to Denver, his old home town, youngsters followed him in droves, clamoring for a chance to feel his muscle. The mayor, no less, had him address a public meeting, the feature of which, by the way, was this piped inquiry from the gallery. Say, Doug, can you whip William Farnham? And let no one quarrel with this popularity. It is a good sign, a healthful sign, a token that the blood of America still runs warm and red, and that chalk has not yet softened our bones. This is the end of Laugh and Live. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com.